Member Castrisov. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, I think I want to join with my colleagues and other members of parliament that express appreciation to all the frontline workers, the doctors, the nurses, the firefighters, police officers, and everyone else who is in the forefront of leading this national fight against the coronavirus. And of course, to all the St. Lucians who lost family and friends overseas since we do not seem to have had. Is there a problem, Mr. Speaker? So I think we want to express our condolences, our sympathies to all those individuals, Mr. Speaker. And I think, Mr. Speaker, I want to start off where, Mr. Speaker, at the last sitting when we approved the state of emergency, where, Mr. Speaker, I made a clear point, Mr. Speaker, that, Mr. Speaker, we on this side, we did not support a state of emergency. We said, and the leader of the opposition mentioned again this morning, that we are going to give the government all the space to allow them to formulate an approach that they think is most required at this point in time to fight the COVID virus. We said, Mr. Speaker, and I repeat, that every power that has been exercised can be done under other legislation. And the member from Strozel Saldiba said it. I was the first one who said, this is a war. But Mr. Speaker, it is a medical war. It is not a military war. The state of emergency is conceived of for situations where you have insurrection, there are threats to national security, there is a, uh, an invasion of your country. Those are the circumstances where you have extraordinary power and you exercise a state of emergency. When you have a medical war like we have, Mr. Speaker, there is in legislation provisions for us to get the same powers that we need. So we said, look, we don't think you should have a state of emergency. There are provisions that you can use to achieve the same objectives. But if you decide you want to use the state of emergency, go ahead, do it. But we will remain vigilant. We will monitor what you're doing. And in the state of emergency, we are not going to give up our right and responsibility to the people who elected us. And we stated that position. And I was so happy, Mr. Speaker, that a couple of weeks after we stated it, the newly elected leader of the Labour Party in England, Mr. Speaker, actually stated a position very similar to ours. And I, and I, I want to, Mr. Speaker, read it out to you so you can appreciate, Mr. Speaker, the exact point that we were making, and some people believe, and the new leader, Sir Keir Starmer, he made the point. At moments like this, he promised to work constructively with the government to confront the pandemic and not engage in opposition for opposition's sake. But he added, we will shine a torch on critical issues and where we see mistakes or faltering government or things not happening quickly as they should, we will challenge that and call that out. Our purpose when we do that is the same as the government's to save lives and to protect our country. And Mr. Speaker, some people seem to be of the view that if you express concerns, then you are being political. If you ask questions, you are being political. 
If you say that the police at the checkpoints need to have a portable toilet, you are being political. If you say there is a need for PPE for frontline workers, you are being political. If you ask what are the testing that we're doing, you are being political. Is that being political, Mr. Speaker? Have we lost the right to ask questions and express concerns? We cannot, Mr. Speaker, abrogate the right that has been given to us by the people who elect us to ask questions. And we will ask those questions. And we will maintain the position, Mr. Speaker, that a state of emergency, all the powers that are used under, can be obtained elsewhere, Mr. Speaker. The member for Viewfort North asked a very important question. He said he was hoping to get a report on the use of the state of emergency. How has it been used, its successes, and to lay a case by the Prime Minister as to why it should be extended. And he was disappointed he had not heard that. That's his assessment. He did not deserve the member from Ancillary Canaries, Mr. Speaker, to have to attack him the way he did, Mr. Speaker. But I ask the people of St. Lucia to focus on one thing. The member from Ancillary Canaries said, St. Lucia is the best in the Caribbean for dealing with COVID. We lead in the region in management of COVID cases. We lead in the region in testing. But St. Lucia has remembered that same minister in February who was saying to us, we are doing the best in the Caribbean. Our economy is booming. Hotels are being opening and flights are coming and things are good in St. Lucia in February. In February, the same person, the same person who saying St. Lucia is leading the Caribbean in everything was the same one in February telling us how great our economy is. And we'll come back to that at another time. And he almost sounded like Trump. I have the most massive testing in the world. I'm doing testing in millions and everything. He, sound, he sounded a bit like Bolom Trump. Yeah, Mr. Yeah, Speaker. Yeah. I'll move on, Mr. Speaker. I, know, I see you're about to press your mic, so I'll move on. But he, that was his conduct this morning, Mr. Speaker. But Mr. Speaker, there is a medical response to corona. A medical response. And none of us would criticize the Ministry of Health and I'll tell you why. We have to rely on what the Ministry of Health, Health tells us. We are not doctors. We're not in the know. We're not involved in the front line. So we have to rely on what you're saying to us. But there's a lot of whispering going on in the society. A lot of whispering. And this is St. Lucia. This is St. Lucia where a lot of people know a lot of things and they share a lot of information. But let us give thanks and praise to the medical workers, Mr. <laughs> Speaker. Because I have friends who are nurses. I have friends who are doctors, Mr. Speaker. It's very close to home. And we must give thanks and praise to them. They have police officers who are friends of mine. Mr. Speaker, let's give thanks and praise to them. But we're talking about political leadership, Mr. Speaker. Political leadership. And on April 11th, in the Independent, Alistair Campbell wrote an article about the New Zealand Prime Minister. And bear with me, Mr. Speaker, because I need to read it. Because in that article, Mr. Speaker, is a strong contrast to what we experience in St. Lucia. And I want St. Lucians to listen to it. And you'll understand why we're saying, if you have a state of emergency, the kind of political leadership we want. Hear what he says. You have to lead. You have to devise, execute, and narrate a strategy. You have to set out difficult choices, make difficult decisions, and know this one. Take the country into your confidence about why you are making them. You have to show genuine empathy for the difficulties your people are facing and take them with you. And he goes on, and that's where it really gets interesting. Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, you know, I'm wasting your time. <laughs> Listen to this one, Mr. Speaker, and for the member from Ancillary Canaries who say I'm wasting his time. The leader of New Zealand, she spelled out very clearly how difficult it would be for everyone. She didn't say, don't panic, buy. 
Instead, she explained, smiling, how the supermarkets, the pharmacies, and the petrol stations would function and they would stay open. She spoke to New Zealanders' sense of themselves, creative, practical, country-minded, and she ended by urging everyone to be strong, be kind, and unite against COVID-19. And I can go on, Mr. Speaker, but the point that's been made is that political leadership is essential in times of crisis. And sometimes it's not entirely the fault of the Prime Minister. There are surrogates are wrong. Every time you write something, they jump on you, they bully you on social media. Political, political, political. But the tone has been created in this country. And very soon, Mr. Speaker, we'll come back to those issues. A tone has been created in this country. It's a bitter tone. We've created a bitter society. Persons have engendered, you know, a sense of fear and of discrimination in this country that paralyzes people from wanting to express their opinion because they'll be called political. We witness it here from the member from Ancillary Canvas. And like I said, very Trumpian like, like Bolom Trump, Mr. Speaker. Honorable Mr. Speaker. Member, Mr. Earlier, you prevent you pretty much stop me from responding to you by telling me you're moving on. Please not go back into... Mr. Speaker, you know, the political leadership of this country, especially those in government, could have taken the people in their trust and taken them along this journey. And let's not talk about COVID cases and how well it's been managed. We talk about people having confidence, Mr. Speaker, that when they are called upon to make sacrifices, they will do so and they will not feel that you're making sacrificial lambs out of them. That's what is needed, Mr. Speaker. Sure. Mr. Speaker, I heard a member from Ansari Country said how the leader of the opposition was consulted on everything. He's a humble man, Mr. Speaker, but I know for a fact he was not consulted on everything. I know he was invited to a number of NAMAC meetings, but I think he's co-chair. Mr. Speaker, I stood up in this house before all this COVID issue became a big issue. And I said, talk to the people of St. Lucia. Explain to them. Open up with them. Members opposite shouted at me. But it's you that cause it. You're going to cause panic. You're going to cause fear. And I'm thinking to myself, this is going to be our most difficult period in history. You need to win over the confidence of the people to carry them along. And so said, so done. The rest is history. I know the leader of the opposition was not consulted. In fact, I was upset with the leader of the opposition when I learned that the Prime Minister would usually call him an hour before to update him on what he would be saying to the nation, not consulting him and asking for his views on it. But Mr. Our Speaker, leader... I rise in a point of order. The member continues to mislead the House. I wasn't going to stand the... up, Mr. Speaker. What is but, the point? No, let me hear. But was that Mr. Speaker? No, no let me hear the point. Yeah. Here. Mr. Speaker, play the tape. I, this is what I said. I said the leader of the opposition was invited to a number of events. The leader of the opposition, and a point of order, then rose to say that that wasn't true. He was only invited to one function. So for the leader for Castri South to now suggest that I say, said, that the leader of the opposition was invited to everything is a gross misrepresentation of the facts of, as they have played out here in the house today but mr speaker he has an economic uh, an economical relationship with the truth i don't expect any differently mr speaker you should make him apologize to me i mean i don't think he appreciates you know, Come on, Mr. occasions Mr. and moments of importance, Mr. Speaker. So, Mr. Speaker. Oh, Mr. Speaker, I would like the misrepresentation to be withdrawn. That's not what I said. Between you and the leader of the opposition, this was dealt with. He has now moved on to consultation. When you rise at a point of order, you're rising yeah. at a point where he was talking about consultation. You've rightly said that you made a statement, the leader of the opposition refuted that. We dealt with that and we move on. No, 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 uh, Mr. Speaker. No, no, no. I, you, you're we not made the hearing. point and we move on from that. He's now dealing with consultation, and that is why I'm, I am allowing him to continue on that point. Yeah. But it's a gross misrepresentation to say. Honorable member. I said the Honorable member. Was the time has. To Honorable member. Totally different.
You may continue. Yeah. So, Mr. Speaker, I really would have liked for the leader of the opposition to be consulted in a more meaningful way. But the leader of the opposition has made it clear to us that he does not want any solution to believe that we were not prepared and we were not available to lend our cooperation in this time of national crisis. He said that to all of us. And we will abide by that, that guidance. Because we want St. Lucia to succeed. Mr. Speaker, think about it. If St. Lucia does not succeed, every single one of us living on this rock is affected. Mr. Speaker, in the next year or so, there will be critical decisions to be made in St. Lucia. We don't want to inher inherit a ship that has been totally destroyed and battered and abandoned. We don't want that. We don't want that. We want St. Lucia to succeed. We want the medical people to succeed. We actually want the government to succeed. But we cannot give up our right to point out where we believe things are not being done properly for us to raise concerns. We have to be able to do so. Mr. Speaker, I made the point about trust and taking the people along. There is a problem. The people of St. Lucia does not trust this government. It does not trust this government, Mr. Speaker. And you know, you constantly, you constantly see examples of it, Mr. Speaker. Some of them just cannot help themselves. Mr. Speaker, the member from Australia can, can we spoke about the Nemo food packages, Mr. Speaker. And I want to say something about it. What I know, Mr. Speaker, and I don't know whether those powers came from under the state of emergency, I was told that Nemo would be doing the packing and Nemo would be sending all the packages to the disaster management committees who would have had lists and they would have distributed to those persons. Politicians would not have been involved. That's what I was told as a parliamentary representative. And I can tell you, Mr. Speaker, and for the record, I want it on record in Hansard. On day five of the seven-day lockdown, Cassius South had not received packages. And you know the other thing, sometimes we underestimate the St. Lucia we live in. There are people at Nemo who knew what was going on. And people talk in this country. And there are parliamentary representatives who went to Nemo, collected packages, and went to distribute in their constituencies. They went to distribute in their constituencies. And there are photos of them, and they're still denying it, even though there are photos of them at Nemo. And Mr. Speaker, what was a proper system put in place by Nemo was violated and vulgarized by certain parliamentary representatives. And I want to express, as a representative for Cassidy South, my total disappointment with the government for the handling of those packages. And I heard the member from Ancillary Canaries boasting, Cassidy's East was the first one to get packages and chastising the leader of the opposition. But he did not say who in Cassidy's East went for the packages and distributed it. And Mr. Speaker, it amazes me how they could so boldfacedly and shamelessly say others, other things than the truth. There were videos of people in Cassius East saying who brought the packages for them and complaining about it. Mr. Speaker, who you think they're fooling? But if you can be so boldfaced and shameless, how do you expect the people of Central to trust you and believe you? How? How do you expect to deliver crisis? Mr. Speaker, Mr. Speaker, the Archbishop, the Archbishop, it's no secret. The Archbishop has asked to apologize for a parable he used. He, Mr. Speaker, when certain people, rather than use their diplomatic muscle to get benefits of St. Lucia, they use it to call the Vatican to force the Archbishop to apologize. Now, I didn't mention anybody's name, so if anybody's Speaker, offended, let them stand. Speaker. Thank you, Rice. I would beg the member if, in fact, that he has any evidence to show that any member or this government used any influence in the Vatican. If he has not, then I would ask him to withdraw that statement because that is a damning allegation that, that has no validity. And I have no idea what it has to do with this debate either. I think the member from Cassius is to tell you there's something in Creole for Monsieur Joël Metli. Honorable, so, honorable. Mr. Speaker, 
I can translate for the member from Miku South. No, 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 no. I'm not asking you to translate okay. anything. Mr. Speaker. You may come. <laughs> Mr. Speaker. I, I, no, no, your mic, Mr. Speaker. So my point is, Honorable, you see, there's something that there's no, there's no allegation made against any parliamentarian in that oh. statement. So I'm not going to. He did, no, he did not say. He did not point. He did not point any finger. Mr. Speaker. No, 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 no. Yes. Uh, can I be corrected? <laughs> yes. Let me hear what you okay. say. Did the member not say that instead of the government using its political influence to get the Vatican to do good things, it was causing and causing? Is that was not what he said? No, honourable president. Okay, Mr. Thank you. So, so, Mr. Speaker, rather than deal with the fundamental issues facing this country, rather than they continue to feed on that bitterness that they've created in the society, they continue to feed on it, Mr. Speaker. And when you, when you, when you raise issues, they want to bully you for saying certain things. Bully you for saying certain things. Mr. Speaker, Venezuela is a case in point. Other Caribbean islands have gotten hundreds of testing kits to carry out testing. St. Lucia has not gotten. Venezuela has been in its usual approach to the Caribbean, a friend of the Caribbean. But St. Lucia joined a group of nations that sought to undermine the sovereignty of Venezuela. And we could not share in that fraternal gift from Venezuela and Mr. Speaker, I don't know if you hear in the whispers that somebody is going to meet Trump very soon. I don't know if you heard the whispers. Just watch and see that we'll go to Trump and ask Trump if you can give us a little something. Because things had, Mr. Speaker. The same people who did not want from Cuba, but now they're praising Cuba and they're thanking Cuba. Many of us on this side remember our days when we championed and defended the Cuban cause. The member from Labry just walked in, he was one of them. Now were you the, the former prime minister? All of us. And we are condemned. History has a way of absolving righteous causes, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, let me say a couple of things. And I want to ask the prime minister, as a competent authority, and he may be willing to help me. The issue of alcohol, and my constituents are asking me those questions. What really is wrong with an individual going to a supermarket and buying a bottle of wine to take home to, to drink in the comfort of his home? I understand and I support closing down the restaurants and the bars where people congregate and drink. But is there anything fundamentally wrong with somebody going to a supermarket and buying a drink to take home to drink at his home? Some people have contacts where they can still get alcohol, they can still get wine. But what about those of us that don't have those contacts? And some of my people want to know, when will a competent authority ease up on that, the same way they're easing up on certain businesses opening and certain businesses conducting their affairs? Church services, Mr. Speaker, think about it. Does a cathedral only have to have 10 persons in there? Many other churches in my constituency can host more than 10 people and still have social distancing. Why can some businesses open, like s, &S with people chuck a block inside there? Little regard for social distancing, even in this present period. Some businesses, I must tell you, are making an extraordinary effort. Some are making an effort to ensure social Mr. distancing. Mr. Speaker, on a point of order. Mm -hmm. Mr. Yes. Speaker, I do not think that it is appropriate that the, the member uses a business with his opinion that people are chock and block inside these places. Because, as indicated by the Minister of Commerce, the protocols were put in place. I believe that this is creating prejudice against an established business. And if the member cannot substantiate what he is saying, it should be withdrawn. Why are we bringing these people into the politics of what is happening in the house? 
So, Mr. Speaker… Let me… let me… let me say something. Um, we have to be… it's a balancing act, whether it is by me, but it's a balancing act that has to take place. Is the right to privacy and to protect citizens or persons, because companies are persons in the, under the law, persons out there, and at the same time, to protect the right of members of this house to have their right to speak. Um, so I have to be, I cannot deny you that right in here that is guaranteed to you by the Constitution and our standing orders and protect persons out there. So it's a balancing act that I have to do the same time I have to balance persons out there against members of the South. And it's a right I have and it's one that I have to exercise and I try always, first and foremost, to give members of the House and to protect the right of members of this House to speak. You may proceed, Honorable. So, again, I asked the, the Prime Minister, um, I mentioned the alcohol, I mentioned the churches and where it is not time for churches to be allowed to have more than 10 persons because the size of churches can allow for many more people to be at the church and for church service to be conducted. And the point I'm making, Mr. Speaker, is if certain businesses can be allowed to open, churches can be allowed to have more people in the congregation. And the final request I want to make, Mr. Speaker, to the competent authority, the Prime Minister, during the last government, the former representative for Cashree South, Dr. Robert Lewis, got a number of computers, and they are at the Fuashou Community Center. Elections came, the government changed. Those computers are still there. They've never been set up for use. And now when the Ministry of Education is asking, and I don't want to talk about the Ministry of Education because That's it looked like the state of emergency has decimated all sense of rationality in that ministry, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, asking people to donate computers and laptops and PCs. We have PCs downstairs, the community center at Fuashu. As the Ministry of Equity, open up the center, see if those computers are still good, and let the young people of Fuashu to access those computers. And while the Prime Minister has extraordinary powers in the state of emergency, can you get community Wi-Fi for the students of Fuashu? It is shocking to hear persons defending the government say they believe it's only people that are dirt poor that don't have PCs and laptops at their home. And I was shocked that people actually believe everybody in Senegal should have a laptop and a PC at their home and that everybody has Wi-Fi. Everybody they do not have Wi-Fi. And also in Cicera, Cicera community had Wi-Fi. There was elections in June and within a couple months after the Wi-Fi was stopped for whatever reason. I'm not I'm not going to speculate. And again, the students in Sicera need their Wi-Fi. Can you use your extraordinary powers to get the Wi-Fi reconnected in Sicera and to get Fuashio Community Center open up with the PCs so the students can use them? If you're going to use state of emergency powers, use it for those reasons. And of course, I'm sure the young people in Bassa Joseph and Marigo and Lacqua and, you know, Tico Law would also want Wi-Fi, but at least I know in Cicero there was Wi-Fi on June 6, 2016. So, Mr. Speaker, my position remains. The government did not need to have a state of emergency. They have not made a clear case for it to continue. But I will offer a critical review of what they have done so far for the sake of St. Lucians to safeguard lives in St. Lucia. Most importantly, I praise the frontline workers that are giving up so much, the police officers, the doctors, the nurses, the firefighters, to ensure that lives are safe. We want you to succeed for the sake of St. Lucia. And I appeal to the government to show some political leadership that is characterized by caring, kind, empathy. Because this is what the crisis needs now. Thank you very much.